Um, so this is what we're going to talk about. And um, I did also want to mention that um, I have a, a lesson plan with some links and resources for this on my website here at amandafrench.net. So I don't know if you can see that, uh, that URL, um, but it's basically okay. just on my website at amandafrench.net, and I can uh, write that for you. And there's lots, uh, you know, send that to you later. And so here, okay. you know, it, I, this I, 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 I jotted it down. Okay, great. That's great. So I'm going to use this, you know, sort of as, as we teach, um, and then this will be available to okay. you afterward. Um, so uh, do you know if you, did you manage to sign up for a free account on Omeka.net? Yes, ma'am. I'm already logged in. Oh, I'm going to make the screen where it says add, add a site. Perfect. Perfect. So just stay there for a little while, and um, uh, what we're going to do later on is actually log in and, and start playing around with it in, a, in some hands-on exercises. Um, okay. But first I wanted to give a little bit of background about what Omeka is and what it's for. Um, so Omeka is basically just a, a system to build websites, but it's a system to build websites that's really designed especially for scholars and especially for historians. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed that if you're going to a website, maybe something that's, you know, got some historical pictures on it or something, but a lot of those websites don't list um, a source for where that image comes from. They'll just sort of have the image. Maybe there will be a caption, but it doesn't. Right. A lot of times, they don't really have good information about who took that picture, what year is it, what uh, you know, who's in it, uh, where did the where does the physical original reside. Um, so you know, those are things that as historians, um, uh, as scholars, we're really trained to to want to know all of that information. So what Omeka right. is really really good at is helping people build websites where all of the, the kind of media that's uh, on that website, especially images, but not only images, um, includes audio files, video files, really lots of other different kinds of file types, um, are always really thoroughly described with historical information, archival information, so that you can then build kind of nice websites that use those materials that are then fully sourced, you know, sort of to scholarly right. standards. So that's basically what Omeka is. Um, the word, as it says here, Omeka is a Swahili word, meaning to display or lay out wares. So really it is a system for historians in particular to kind of deliver the <coughs> primary sources to the public. And it's used by a lot of libraries, a lot of archives, but also a lot of individual scholars. And it's used by a lot of people who, um, you know, people in organizations, you know, for lots of different purposes. Um, there, are, I'll show you a, a bunch of examples during this of people who are using Omeka for different things. Um, so the system was built by a place you might have heard of called the, the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, which is a, a research center, a humanities research, digital humanities research center attached to George Mason University. Um, so they, uh, you know, early on, about in the 90s, they had some people who were, um, I'll go to their website, uh, they had some <coughs> people who were, you know, had, had taught themselves or had otherwise learned to be really good at technology, historians specifically. And um, so they started quite early in, I forget if it's 93 or 94, and because they're in the D.C. area, they were, um, you know, starting to get hired by a lot of people, you know, including people at the Smithsonian, um, people at the Library of Congress to sort of build a lot of historical websites. And what they realized was that they were doing the same kind of thing over and over again. That they, they were, you know, that for every kind of historical exhibit that they were building on the web, they needed to create a database that would keep track of all of the, the archival materials and then, you know, have a kind of a front-end delivery system where you could make a nice website from those materials. So what they decided to do was just build a system that would, you know, save them some work of having to build that on a custom basis every time. And that's what became Omeka. So they started to build it in 2006, um, but they had sort of early versions of it before that. They had been doing this work since the 90s. They had begun to make systems to, to deliver this kind of thing. One of the first projects to use you know, very, very early version of what would become Omeka 
is this site called the Hurricane Digital Memory Bank, which has um, a lot of material about both Katrina and Rita. So you can see here if you click on items, actually even just on the front page, I'll go back to the front page, there are lots of different kinds of materials here. There are images, there are stories, you know, so images from the hurricanes. Um, there are stories from people who went through the hurricanes, um, you know, some of which have images attached, but some of which are just, you know, what I remember. Well, and this, this is a good this is a good example of what I want my site to look like. Exactly, and so this was built in '95. We have oral histories, so these are audio recordings, um, and this is all done with kind of an early, well, I guess not all of them are oral histories. Some of them are, are just doc files, um, but they do have video as well, and they have a map, and then all of this is searchable. So I mean, I haven't tested this search. But it's, I mean, we could look for church, for instance, and see, okay, well, we've got 237 things that are about churches. Here's an image of a church um, that was presumably affected by um, Rita or Katrina, African American church in New Orleans, um, blew out the stained glass windows. Oh, no, I see what that is. Oh, it's dreadful. Um, that kind of thing. I and mean, then here it is on the map. So um, that, that's one of the early sites to use a really early version of a Mac. I think they have updated it since then. I think it looks um, really nice. You can see they've got 13, nearly 14,000 items um, in this. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, 23,000. They have 13,000 images. <laughs> 23,000 images. Wow, they've got, it's a, it's a big project, you know, and it's been going for over 10 years, so it's kind of no wonder. Um, another early site. I actually worked on this site a little bit when I was at Virginia Tech a couple of years ago. Um, this is a, a kind of an older version of Omeka, but this was again to kind of commemorate history as it happened. Um, so in 2007 there were the shootings at Virginia Tech um, and this site, the April 16th archive, was built to collect again archival materials and memories from people um, about that. So there are images here of uh, about the classes that were in the building where the, shoot, the shootings happened. And you can see here that there, you know, this is well described, right? Mm -hmm. So here is, here, here's the actual file that it's, you know, describing. This is a picture of, you know, the sign that they put up. It actually kind of makes me cry a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, they, they said, hey, you know, we're not going to hold classes in this building where all these deaths happen. You know, your classes will be held in this other building. And just a, sort of a really everyday <sighs> sign. But in that context, it's like, oh, it's so sad. But, you know, they, there's really a lot. This isn't just sort of an image on a website somewhere. This has a lot of uh, information about who created this, you know, Megan Minter and, like, the fact that there are, you know, that she took that picture and submitted it to this archive herself, um, all of that kind of thing. So um, here's another, you know, similar like an account written by somebody on LiveJournal about going through the shootings and wow. who did it and the date that they wrote it and what language it's in. And then it's linked to a bunch of other, um, you know, uh, items in the, in the material. In the, in the archive, so I don't know. Um, Torgerson is a building. It's the engineering building at uh, mm -hmm. at Virginia Tech, and there's two items there. And again, like what you can do is is search for things in this archive. Um, if you go to the advanced search, um, you can, for instance, I you know I don't always use the the advanced search. Sometimes I like to look for particular kinds of materials. So these are just the default kinds of materials you can look for in Omeka. So if we were to look for, um, I don't know, sound. I don't know if there are any sound files, but we can at least see if there are. No, there aren't. Uh, not in this um, archive, but there probably are in here. So, you know, you can see that these sites look very different, but they're, they have some commonalities. And I'm going to show you even more Omeka sites before we get to, into hands-on work, and we will get into hands-on work. But similarly here, you know, you can look for the same kinds of things because all of this comes just built in with Omeka. Also, no sound files here. They have videos, but no, uh, I always think of oral histories as sound files, but I guess they just meant they wrote them down. Um, 
So, you know, nobody has to develop this from scratch. That's already baked into Omeka projects, which is really great. And so those are quite early um, projects that were uh, using early versions of Omeka. Omeka 1.0 was officially released for public use in June 2009. So well after, you know, this 2005, um, the hurricanes and the 2007 shootings, um, you know, they were developing it really on real projects, on real historical projects before they really released it for everybody to use. So when they first um, released Omeka, um, they, well, it was this. Now there's three versions of Omeka. <laughs> I used to teach this, you know, about how there were two versions of Omeka, but there's really now three. Um, but when they first released Omeka, they released it um, as a system that would be useful for people who basically already knew how to build websites. So if you go to Omeka.org and click on Omeka Classic, this is where you can get uh, Omeka the system to install on a web host, such as Reclaim Hosting, which we had talked about. What they discovered was that a lot of people didn't know <laughs> how to manage a server or how to install database-driven software on a server. And they wanted it to be really accessible to historians and to other people who really didn't want to manage all of that. So that's why they built Omeka.net. So Omeka, Omeka Classic is software that essentially web developers can get to download and install on a server to build their own Omeka site. But you don't have to do that. I, I mean, the analogy I usually use is like, a lot of people use Facebook and the way you use Facebook is you sign into your account and then you use Facebook. Um, <clears throat> Facebook doesn't give you the Facebook software so that you can set up your own Facebook. <laughs> okay. Right? But Omeka does. Omeka says, here's the Omeka, you know, software so you can set up, you know, your own Facebook. Um, but a lot of people don't want to set up their own Facebook. They just want to use Facebook. And so Omeka.net, which is what I'll show you, is, um, is, is where you do that, where you go to just use it and not, you know, build your own whole system. And for most, right. for most people, for a lot of projects, it, that's really all you need. Um, the other thing I, I tend to say about this is that um, using Omeka.net versus using Omeka Classic on Omeka.org, it's kind of like being Spider-Man, um, with great power comes great responsibility. So with Omeka Classic, you have a lot of power. You have total control over everything, but you have to know what you're doing and you have the responsibility to make sure that it doesn't break and all of that. And you, you know, it's, it can be a great teaching tool. I actually love to, you know, sometimes require, teach students really carefully over the course of a semester how to do this um, because it can be great to learn a lot of web skills that way. On the other hand, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility. You have total control over everything, but you know it's more work. On Omeka.net, it's easier, much easier. But on the other hand, you're going to run up against uh, limits. It doesn't do this thing that I want it to do, and I can't make it do that. Um, so that's the trade-off, you know. Or, or the other analogy I use is like renting a house versus buying a house. Um, Omeka.net is like renting, you know, your landlord is going to come and, you know, clean out your gutters and mow your lawn and you don't have to deal with that or fix your toilet if you have a good landlord and Omeka does have good landlords here, but, you know, sometimes you want to buy a house so that you can paint everything pink or something. So, so that's the basic difference. But um, both of these systems look, um, they look alike. Uh, they're, they're the same to use pretty much once you get into actually managing the site. So um, sometimes I advise people that if they, you know, to start out with Omeka.net and build from there, you know, if they find, if they run up against too many limits, then they can always move their site to Omeka, you know, uh, their own Omeka installation by getting the software at Omeka.org. And, it, you know, that's what a lot of people do with, with their housing, too. They start out renting and eventually they save up money and, you know, fix their credit and so on and buy a house. Um, so it's more responsibility. Um, so that's basically the difference between Omeka.net and Omeka.org, and we'll be working with Omeka.net later. Um, <clears throat> just to mention, because I, I like the, the finances, you know, like how, how this uh, system is provided, um, it's a nonprofit project entirely, and it's been mostly funded by um, federal grants 
and by <clears throat> private foundations. So it's very much a, a, a public source. It's not a for-profit company. It's not a commercial product. Um, the, if you do want to go, um, you know, get the Omeka software from Omeka.org, it's totally free. It's totally open source, which means that if you're a programmer, you can hack into the code and do whatever you want with it. Um, you can't do that on Omeka.net just because they wouldn't be able to manage the whole thing if they let everybody do that amount of hacking. But, but it, is, it is by scholars for scholars. It's been funded by the Mellon Foundation, by the Institute for Museum and Library Services, which is a federal agency. Uh, I think it's been funded by, um, by the NEH, they, uh, um, and so on. Um, they, there is, um, you, if you, you'll notice on Omeka.net that there are plans you can pay for, right? So you've got a free site, and they offer a lot of free sites. Um, they do also offer paid plans, but really what they're doing in this case is they're the, they have a, an organization um, that, uh, called the Corporation for Digital Scholarship, which is a nonprofit organization, even though it's got corporation in the, in the name. And really all, they're, they're, all you're paying for with this is storage space. So they have an organization, so it, it's really, it's not for profit at all, but if you have 50 gigabytes of data, that costs a lot of money. <laughs> so it's kind of just, you know, right. it's, it's, it's that. And that's the other thing is like, you can, you, if you could get the library or the university to give you, if you needed 50 gigabytes of storage and you could get your university or your library to install Omeka Classic on a, ser on a server and give you that storage for free, well then you could get it for free. Obviously the university or the library would be paying for it on some level. But um, this is, you know, this is available, but it's primarily where you're paying for is, is storage space and a little bit more complexity in the site because that does create some work for the people who it, manage the whole Explain the pl plugins for. What's that? The plugins? Explain plugins. Yes, I'm getting to that. Yeah, we will get to that. Okay. You bet. Um, let's see. In fact, is that next? Um, that's going to be like about halfway through. <laughs> I have a couple okay, of no other problem. things to show you, but uh, let's see. Because um, I want to show you the front end first, and plugins are kind of a back end thing. Okay, um, I mean, no the, short, the short version is that plugins um, extend the functionality of the site, they make it do more things. So there's very specialized plugins that you can install. It's like you know, Mr. Potato Head, right? You know, Mr. <clears throat> Omeka is the Mr. Potato Head, and then you can put a nose on it, or you can put a mouth on it, or you can put a different nose on it, or you can put a mouth with a pipe on it. And so that's what plugins okay. are. They, they, they change what the, the software can do. But I'll demonstrate some of those later. Okay. So I, want, I showed you already a couple of Omeka sites, and I wanted to show you this one too, partly because this one is on Omeka.net. Um, Omeka, I should say, is really widely used. I mean, really hundreds of thousands of people use it, either you know just the software itself or, or on Omeka.net. So the, whole, the city of Boston has used Omeka.net to put up some of its archival materials. And the reason I like to show this site is because it's a very simple Omeka site, but it's got the basic building blocks of what an Omeka site is. So the first, I wanted to define some terms now um, that are, are common to pretty much all Omeka sites. So item is one term. And in fact, I will, I'll, I'll open up these other sites as well, the Hurricane Archive in particular, um, these ones that we did look at. Um, so where am I? So an item is a really key sort of concept in Omeka. And an item can be, it's basically just one unit. So often an item can be one image. But you'll notice here, this is an image of, um, you know, a handwritten um, log uh, from the city of Boston uh, from their, one of their schools. But this item, which is called Horace Mann School for the Deaf Student Register, has two images with it because it's got an image of the cover of that book and then it's got an image of a page within it. So it's important to remember that an item, you know, doesn't always mean one file. Um, it can mean um, multiple files, but you know it could be um, you could have a three-page handwritten letter, and that's one item, but it's got three different um, files attached to it. 
So an item is really, but you know, if you wanted to, you could create three different items from, you know, make each page be an item. Um, but, but that's what items are, and almost every Omeka site has this, some kind of items um, tab up here, and you can see that there are 119 items in here. Again, mostly images. Most Omeka sites are kind of based on images, but it really does handle lots of different kinds of work. So here, too, on the Hurricane Archive, they have items, and they have lots of different kinds of items. Um, I, I guess it, when you click on items, it goes immediately to images, but you can go to all items. Um, they must do that because it looks prettier. <laughs> you know, these don't have any <laughs> images with them, right? They're just doc files. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to read them, but they don't look as nice. Um, so this site has items. This site also has items. So that's, and this has, you know, nearly 2,000 items. That's an important concept in Omeka. And again, anytime you click on one of these items, you're going to see um, all of this descriptive information about it, which again is one of the key things, um, key important things about Omeka and that makes it look um, you know, really professional. Um, one of the things that's really, um, that makes Omeka a scholarly system is the existence in these items of metadata. And that's another term I want to define. I don't know if you've been using that term a lot in your research. Um, it's pretty much a librarian yeah. term, and it just means that descriptive information about that about that item. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, for, I'm familiar with it. I did some uh, some scanning uh, seminars uh, uh, with photos, mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of you know JPEG, uh, TIFF, the types of metadata that you save as it relates to the uh, the item right yeah and there's there's a lot of these um, these files don't but you can you can add technical metadata as well as just this descriptive metadata so just mean metadata just means data about data you know descriptive information about the stuff you know your items so this has title it has a subject it has a description it has who you know the photographer um, here's this collection it came from the date um, the rights what is it um, and then sometimes they'll have um, technical metadata like like from scanning like you know what DPI resolution. is it and yeah exactly exactly what resolution and this doesn't happen to have that but that Omeka does manage that if you want to put that in there um, so so metadata is a really key point of pretty much any item um, you click any item in here and of course sometimes you don't know all this information you don't know who took the picture you don't know when it was taken or you know where it was taken any of that but you know, it does, Omeka at least really strongly encourages you to, to put all of that in. Um, I wanted to mention the term Dublin Core. So Dublin Core is a kind of an unfamiliar term, but it's a metadata standard. And so it, it what it is, is it, it's like a core curriculum in that it says you need these kinds of information for every object. Um, and the importance about having that be standardized is that then different systems can exchange it. So the reason it's called Dublin Core, it's a core set of, of metadata uh, elements, title, subject, author, date, that kind of thing. And it's, it's <clears throat> called Dublin because they set these standards in Dublin, Ohio in 1995. <laughs> so it's not Dublin, Ireland, but you know, in Dublin they said, okay, here's the kind of information that we need for digital items. And then they set that standard of about 15 fields. And that's what Omeka is based on. And that's important because it means that when you put things into Omeka, other systems like library systems, archive systems can, you know, you can pass the items, you migrate the items, you know, between systems and have it be standard. Like stupid things like, I don't know if you've ever, like some systems have first name, last name, and some systems only have name, right? And if they're not, the same, you know, like, oh, I've got two fields with first name, last name, and how do I get that into one field with name, right? So if, unless that's standardized, it's harder to exchange the information. Um, so I just wanted to mention that term Dublin Core because you might see it. Um, I've demonstrated the search a little bit. <coughs> I've showed you um, some item types. Um, the, uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit more about this advanced search, which again comes packaged with Omeka. Um, these are, these first 
15 or so are the sort of default fields, the Dublin core, the core fields. Um, but you can add other fields as well, some of which are also standardized. So you can have, you know, there's tons of, you know, types of information that you could enter. So transcription, for instance, if you have an audio file, um, you can have a whole field where you can type in what somebody says, physical dimensions of a, of a photograph, all of that stuff. Um, similarly, the type, these are the, the, these are the default types of items. You know, is this item a document? Is it a moving image, meaning like a video? But you can also add custom types. So you can add quilt or coin or, uh, you know, whatever kind of item type you want um, to there. So that's good to know. <coughs> Tags is another term I wanted to, to talk about. Um, here where I clicked on the items, uh, we've got 119 items. We could search the items, we've been to the search, but you could also browse by tag, and you can see the tags here. And that's just a way of, you know, enabling somebody to, to browse through similar things. Um, so Katie Curran, there are three items about her, whoever she is, um, and it's ways to link different items together. So tags are super useful in, uh, in Omeka. And they're kind of, they're outside of the Dublin core scheme. Right, so because you know these kinds of title, subject, description, date, that's all very kind of regimented. But with the tags, you can put in whatever else you think might be interesting for people, and then they can click on that. <coughs> uh, featured items. I just wanted to mention that every sort of out of the box, every site has just um, on the front page. It um, you know, and this can be very can be fairly customized, but it has a featured item meaning. You know, whenever you add things, you can say, hey, I want to feature this, meaning I want it to be in this space on the front page. Um, this site has that as well. Um, featured image here. A lot of them, if you mark more than one thing as featured, when you refresh the page, it it's just loads one of them randomly. So it's a way of just, you know, surfacing things you really like to the front page. Um, <coughs> so that's a good feature of Omeka. And then the next term I wanted to um, to talk about is collections. So I've talked about I talked about items and I talked about a lot of things to do with items, you know, like the metadata and the item type and all of that. But the next sort of organizing term for Omeka is collections. So this this site has items, collections, and exhibits. So we've looked quite a bit at items, uh, but if we look at collections, there's two collections here. One is Jesse Harding Pomeroy, Boston's youngest murderer or Boston Public Schools. And all that, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a collection of images. They really are a lot like tags, um, or they're like collections and archives. So if you have like the papers of William Faulkner or something. But you know, you can define a collection however you want, and then all that's going to do is list certain items in that collection. So it's like a file folder. Um, and, it, and it really does function a lot like a tag. One big difference between collections and tags is that <clears throat> if an item is in a collection, it can't be in any other collection. It can only be in that collection. And that's not true for tags. You could add, you know, as many tags as you want to an item, and you can add, you know, the same tag to a bunch of different items. So, and the main reason for that is because it's, it's, like files in your folder on your desktop, you know, you want to make sure you know where it is. You don't have to create collections and you don't have to put items in there, but they're a good organizing principle if you do need them. Um, and then exhibits, that's the last term I want to talk about um, before we start really going, going hands-on. Well, plugins and themes, but we'll, we'll log, it's the last front-end term that I want to talk about. So, you know, this, this in itself is pretty useful. <coughs> Um, you know, you've just got a searchable database of a bunch of items. That's great. And actually, I think about um, a majority of Omeka users kind of stop there. They just build this searchable and browsable database. But one of the great things about Omeka is that, that you can create what are called exhibits, which are kind of like multimedia essays, or they're like, you know, history museum exhibits. Um, if you've got a, if you create an archive um, like this one of, 100 items, 200 items, or like some of the other ones, you know, 2,000 items, you want to um, 
you know, if you're, if those were in a museum, like if a museum owns a thousand items, they're not going to put them all on display every time. Actually, museums usually own a lot more than that. They own 20,000 items and then they create an exhibit. They pick out a few of them and um, write interpretive text about them. And so that's really what exhibits are. They're a lot like museum exhibits where you take a few selected items from your whole archive and write about them. So for instance, they have an exhibit here called, uh, which is about Boston Public Schools. And really all it is is um, pages. So it's kind of like an essay that you navigate through. And it, you know, this isn't maybe the best designed exhibits. I can show you some, some better ones. But it's writing a lot here outside of the item about these items. In 1815, white businessman <clears throat> Aviel Smith, it's really tiny text. Um, and you, there's a lot of, and then when you click on this, you get to the item. So this is all just descript this is just factual information, right, in the um, in the item. But in the exhibit, there's there's interpretation. You know, you you want to <clears throat> interpret what's important about these images. I don't really like this exhibit because it's not very pretty. <laughs> we can look at a better one. Let's see. I don't know that there are any exhibits in the Hurricane archive. There aren't any in the April 16th archive. Well, let's look at this other exhibit. I have lots of other sites to show, so I could always. They've got five exhibits here. So let's look at the fire department one. Is this any better? Yeah, I don't know. I don't like how they do them, but they do have this tiny text here. Um, let's see if we can find a better example of, a, of an exhibit. Um, if this still exists, oh, it doesn't. Sad. Does this still exist? That was broken too. Here, I'll go to this site. Some of these links are broken. Ah, everything's broken. Great. Okay, let's look at. Um, well, here, I'll look at, oh, here's a good one. This should still exist because it's on Omeka.net. Oh, it doesn't have any exhibits. Let me, that doesn't have exhibits either. Those are really beautiful, but they are. All right, well, I'm going to show you my own site um, that I used Omeka for. Actually, let me just quickly. So I know for sure that works and that there's an exhibit. <laughs> um, so this site is one that I built using Omeka. Um, I renamed, it, this is a catalog of books, basically. So I renamed items to books because all the items in my, in my archive are books. But it's exactly the same thing. You can see browse books, browse by tag, um, the same thing. I've got a, couple, a few collections depending on whose books they were. And then I have only one exhibit. But I said, OK, of these 1,200 books that are in here, I want to talk about some of the modernist books. There's not many pages in here, but I did it like, you know, like an essay. Um, so here's one book in this you know, collection of books that I wanted to write about, which is Ulysses. And then when I click on this, it takes me to information about that, about that item, right? But here's where I'm really writing, interpreting that, that book for you. Um, so when people use um, Omeka in teaching, you know, and here's another book, and then you click on this, and it gets back to all of the information about that book. When people use Omeka in teaching, a lot of times they, they assign their students to, first of all, find some sources, describe them, contribute them to the, the uh, Omeka site, and then to write either in groups or alone, these exhibits about them. So they need to pick which items they want to put in it, and they need to write about them. And you can have exhibits that have you know, multiple items on a page, as the city of Boston has been doing, or you can write a lot about one image. Um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of work with that as well earlier. But that's the concept of exhibits. It's where you write about and interpret all of the items in the archive. So any questions about items, collections, or exhibits? No, I mean, this is very thorough. I mean, I'm taking good notes. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm, 
and titles, metadata, Dublin Core, advanced search tags, yep. feature item collections, exhibits. Yep, and that's all on here too. So I'm basically just kind of telling you everything that's written on this lesson plan. So you can always come back to this. But yeah, taking notes is you're more than welcome to do that. And we are going to get to hands-on stuff pretty soon. I have to update. Oh, this, no, no problem. I mean, you're, you're, you're giving me. You're giving me a lot of stuff that I need in terms of the technical side, yeah. particularly since I'm working with students, kind yeah. of vis-a-vis -vis you. Uh, my my uh, understanding of this better positions them to understand when you actually get a hold to them conceptually what's going on. Right. Exactly. So here um, I have to update all of my list of um, sites that use Omeka because a bunch of them are broken, which is really sad because they were some of my favorites. But here on Omeka.net. Um, they do have a showcase, so if you just go to Omeka.net and click on showcase, they'll show you a lot of different kinds of sites, and that can be, you know, really useful. Um, I'm going I'm to, you know, skim through these um, really quickly just to kind of show you, you know, number one, how many different kinds of sites are using Omeka and the sort of different things <coughs> they use them. So here's one done by the University of Massachusetts in Boston, a collaborative history of segregation in Boston. They again, oh, they do have a few exhibits. Let's look at their exhibits. And they have 12 exhibits. See, now these look much better. So here's one about somebody named Kathleen Sullivan. And here's a whole essay about her. And you can see how it's including a bunch of images. And then again, if we, here's some court document or something. And then, you know, you click through to that. And here's all the description about about what that is. Here's that Dublin core phrase. This is the main reason why I tell people about that because it shows up. You can make it disappear but it shows up on a lot of these. So that document is minutes from the Boston School Committee meeting from 1975. You know you can see that this is very thoroughly described. Um, so that looks like a cool, and this was done by graduate students at UMass Boston, which is cool. Let's see, other ones. I had this one, the um, the Appalachian Dulcimer Archive, which for some reason I really love. <laughs> it's like just a guy who's really into dulcimers, you know. So he's got 77 pictures of dulcimers here. He's got some dulcimer music. Um, you know, this, I, this is not really history, you know, but it's, um, and again, items, collections. So he's got 77 items. You can see he's using the same theme as I did uh, for this. Mm -hmm. Um, and you begin to, you know, start to really recognize, um, you know, what Omeka sites look like. And again, that's one of the limits that people tend to run up against is they're like, oh, I want it to look better. <laughs> and it's like, well, there's only so much you can do on Omeka.net. So this is right. Hermopolis Digital Heritage Management. It must be some Greek thing. <laughs> that's all I know about it. A thousand items in it. Um, it's got text in Greek and a bunch of pictures of buildings. So maybe it's some kind of... I don't know, Greek building archive. Um, see, and they've got custom fields here, which is nice. Um, should it be a monument? Is it restored? Is it reinforced? So they've created their, these custom fields that people can type in information about that so that people can search and browse by that. <coughs> Latina History Project, and then I'll stop, let's see. Southwestern University. Um, they have... You know, and a lot of these are built by universities, archives, libraries, uh, 124 items. Um, Latina history. Here's a, here's some oral histories about Latina experience. Um, yeah, and so here's some, I'm actually glad we came across this because I wanted to show you how, how Omeka handles audio and video. What it does is it embeds a player like this right in the browser. So Hi, my name is Tori Vasquez and I'm here with Marta Cotera. Today is April 14th, 2016. Marta, if you would... So that's an audio file with a picture, but if it were a video <clears throat> file, it would be the same thing. It would just embed a little video player there. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, and it's good that I, I got a chance to see that because I have both. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, it's important that there will be things to decide about, you know, the file sizes of those and so on, but... Um, Hi, my name is Tori Vasquez, and today is April 14, 2016, and I... So there we go. Um, all right, so that's probably enough example sites to show you, but there really are a ton of them, and, 
and there um, these these that I'm looking at are, are ones only ones that are hosted on Omeka.net and these are you know these are only ones that they have chosen to show there really are hundreds of them um, maybe just I'll show you one or two more um, uh, Omeka the the custom version of Omeka the the hosted version of Omeka is used for a lot of other places including for the Digital Public Library of America which is a huge huge project to kind of collect um, digital material, aggregate digital materials from all kinds of places, libraries and museums and so on. And they have a bunch of different exhibits and they are using Omeka for this, but it looks quite different. They've done a lot of custom coding um, uh -huh. to, to make sure that this looks really pretty, but this is running Omeka uh, behind it. So you can, you can kind is of it, see if you click is on... It, is it is okay. Omeka.net or... No, dot .org. So they've, okay. they've gone to Omeka.org and downloaded the software there and installed it on their own server and then hired programmers to hack into it and make it look exactly the way they want. Yeah, you couldn't do okay. anything like at this custom on Omeka.net. Omeka.net sites are all going to look roughly like this. <laughs> or they'll, they'll look like one of four <laughs> different themes you can, you can have. Okay, so where are we? So now I think it's time to log into the site, and we do still have some um, terms to define, but they're, they're back-end terms, so they're, they're terms about managing the site. I'm going to, I hope I won't regret it, but I'm going to close all those. So here at omeka.site.net, you've already created an account, you've logged in, and so when you've logged in, it says something like create a site, correct? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so you can go ahead and do that. With the free plan, um, you get one website. Um, and you can get more if you pay, but usually one site is all anybody needs. And the truth is you can always create a different email address <laughs> and create a new Omeka account and get another free site with that. So it's, what, what's, what should I make the subdomain name? So that's a really good question because, yeah, you have to pick it. Um, I mean, it's up to you, You, because you can always delete this and change it later. So you can name it markorobinson.omeka.net. You can name it, um, you know, wallercounty.omeka.net if you want. Um, you, can't, you can't easily change that once you've created, but we're just going to play around with it for a little bit here. So you could always delete it and then recreate a site with a better domain name if you don't like that. So let me know when you've done that. Okay. And you have 500 megabytes of storage space, right? You have. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Uh, I, I do. I, I, I can skip over the site description right now, right? Yeah, you can just type in, you know. I don't even think it's required, but yeah, you can type in some placeholder text. That site description, though, for when you do publish your site is what shows up in Google search results. So later on, it's important to, to get that right. Remind me, what is it? What information is it asking you for? It's asking you for a site title, and for this, it's asking uh, you for what goes here. Sub, sub domain name uh -huh. and the uh, site title and the site description. Right. Yeah. So those are yeah. So the title is obviously the title that shows up up here in the tab, and or it's what shows up if somebody searches on Google for your site. Um, you know, if if you search for really anything on Google. Um, You know, you get the title of the site is this big blue link, and then this down here is the description. Right. So what you type into that description field would show up here. But, you know, you don't even have to, this site won't even be Googleable really, until you tell it to be. So, not a big deal right okay, now. Okay, so, I, I did. So that's the title, that's the description, and then this part here is the domain, the subdomain name. It's that part. Whatever it comes before the .omeka.net. So you got that all set up? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to click on 
I'm going to right click on view site and open it in a new tab so that we can see the front end of my site. This might look kind of familiar. <laughs> this uh -huh. looks a lot like that city of Boston site, right? right? So this is what my site looks like to other people. Now I've got a black bar up here, which the, uh, which the Boston site does not have because, um, because I'm logged into my own site. So okay. let me find this. Yeah. So this um, city of Boston site that we were looking at has exactly the same theme as mine. It looks like a, lo a lot like mine, but I've got this black bar, which is going to let me manage the site. So I'm logged in. So I have this that says Omeka admin. So I'm going to click on that. And I am, Marco, I am going to, um, oops, I'm apparently not logged in. Um, I am going to just, I'm, I'm still going to demonstrate some stuff for you um, before we get to the hands-on exercises. Okay. Uh, no problem. So here's what, you know, what the back end of my site looks like. If I click on that, it should open in a new tab. Here's what um, people see when they visit, and here's what I see when I click on manage site. And here's the part where I want to define uh, two terms for you themes and plugins, um, which as you might have noticed in the Omeka.net um, pricing plans, um, they talk about how not only do you get more storage and you get more sites, you get more plugins and more themes. So I'm going to define themes and plugins for you now. Um, themes basically just control the look and feel of the site. So in, um, so right now I've got this white site with blue text which looks exactly like that city of Boston. Um, with the basic plan, I get, I think it's four themes. Um, and then the more you pay, the more themes you get. Eight themes, 11 themes, 11 themes. So the place where we find the themes is in appearance. And here we have, yes, the four themes that are available. This one is called Berlin. And each of them is just a sort of a, it's a look and feel. It's a particular look and feel. <coughs> So, uh, and each of them are a little bit customizable. In some of them, you can change the colors and so on, but none of them are, are highly customizable. And, um, you know, this is one of the parts where if you pay more, you can get more options, or if you install Omeka, the Omeka software from Omeka.org on your own server, you can do whatever you want with it. There's lots and lots more themes that you can get that are available, or you can have a designer custom design um, that site so it looks like whatever you want. So I'm going to change my theme right now. I went to appearance and I'm in themes. So I'm right now I'm using this white and blue one called Berlin and I'm going to change to rhythm. I say use this theme and it says the theme has been successfully changed. So I go over to my test site and I hit refresh and it looks different. It's got exactly the same content but it looks different. So you could wow. Themes just basically control how your site looks. Um, we can try that again. We can go to this one, which is this theme is called Seasons. So it's kind of um, blue. Hit refresh. Same exact site. I think I had changed the color in here so that it's it's green. Um, but Still Amanda's tech, test Omeka site, but it looks completely different. Um, the fourth theme that comes for free is called Minimalist. Refresh. There we go, white with purple text. And so you just pick whichever one you like the best. Um, a lot of them have um, the ability to configure them. So they'll have this button here, Configure Theme. You can upload a, a logo image. You can put some text in your footer, which is this part down here. You can, you know, do a bunch of, you know, you can say, oh, I don't like that whole featured item thing. If I uncheck this, save the page, go back here. Right now I have a featured item, but that should go away now. Right, yes, yeah, so no more featured item, although I have featured collection, feature exhibit. I could take all those away. So they're, they're, they're definitely a little bit customizable. And what these options are depend on which theme you're using. 
Um, mm -hmm. But they're not, you know, they're that they they're not that customizable. Um, they're just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I will add all those back in. Featured exhibit, featured collection, featured item, save changes. So that's just the concept of a theme. And again, we can go through that a little bit more later. Um, the other thing you can do here in appearance is you can manage um, what appears in the, the navigation. So the menu here, I'm going to refresh this again. I bring all my future stuff back. I've got the, the very typical browse items, browse collections, browse exhibits, about biography. If you wanted to get rid of all of those browse, you just say, okay, I just want it to say items. Save the changes. It goes to exactly the same place, but it says items now instead of browse items. So that kind of thing. Browse collections. So again, this is more like Facebook where it's, you know, type and hit save. Um, it's not really coding, but it is using <coughs> this software. So, okay, so now it just says items, collections, exhibits about biography. Um, so that's themes um, and, you know, some of the things you can do with themes. Um, and let's talk about plugins. Uh, by the way, I think here on Omeka.net, they don't tell you, you know, they do. Here, here's, here's the names of the themes. So the four, the four that we get are Berlin, see, they have names, these themes, Berlin, which is that white and blue one, Seasons, uh, Minimalist, which is the one I have on right now, and Rhythm, which is the stripy one. Um, but you get more themes uh, here, and you can, they have, uh, most of these themes are also on Omeka.org, so you can always go look at them um, if you want to, to check them out, but you would want to go to Omeka Classic. I don't really want to talk about Omeka S, that's a whole separate thing. <laughs> um, but Omeka Themes, here's where they show you, actually they might do this on Omeka.net as well, but at least here they show you kind of what the themes look like, the basic themes. So, uh, so plugins. Themes control the look and feel of your site. Plugins control what it can do. So it's one of the really great things about Omeka is that it's it's really flexible. People do a lot of different things with it. Um, I don't know if it says um, what it offers in the basic plan, but here they will list the various plugins that come with various different plans. And you know, the more you pay, the more um, plugins you get. In other words, the more you know, it's your white wall tires and your rust coat control and all of that kind of thing. You know, it's your your add-on suit to the basic car that you buy. Um, <laughs> leather seats. I rode in a car with seat heaters lately. Boy, those things are great, man. I would love to have a <laughs> seat heater in my Omeka. So here in my um, my Omeka site, um, I've got 14 plugins. I'm pretty sure these are just the only ones that come. And most of them have things like this um, that if I've activated a lot of these, they should all by default, if you go to that many, Marco, they should say just install. They should just all have this green install button. And um, I, I don't want to talk about like what each of these does. There are little descriptions of each of them. Um, but I will tell you that probably two of the very most useful ones um, are the CSV import here uh, and the exhibit builder. So actually, when I was showing you all those exhibits, you do actually have to activate that by installing this plugin so that you can build exhibits. Um, I'll show you what, what happens if I, um, uh, you can see over here in this menu, I have exhibits as an option. If I were to deactivate this plugin, that item goes away. <clears throat> Same thing here, I've got um, an, you know, an item in the menu for LC Suggest. If I deactivate that, that goes away. Go away IPMH Harvester, deactivate it, goes away. So if I click Activate, it comes back. And then I can do things with the Exhibit Builder. I can click on that menu item and get the option to, to build exhibits. If I were to have clicked Uninstall, it would have deleted my exhibits that I had, so I didn't click that. Um, we can install one. Um, this Hide Elements uh, plugin is kind of useful. 
uh, for instance, I've got, um, here's an item. It's called Family at Kenbridge. This is actually a, an old family photo uh, of mine, of my grandmother's. Um, and it's, you know, it's got some typical metadata elements there. If I were to activate, first install and then activate this hide elements plugin, okay, so it was successfully installed. I'll just go back to the list of plugins so that you can see. Okay, hide elements is now installed. I could configure it if I wanted, but um, this is one that actually doesn't create a menu item. It's just all done through this configure tab. But I can say, I want to hide all of the, I don't know, all of the creators from every single item. So for this item, it's got a fake creator, John Doe, Jane Doe. And if I click all of those and then click Save Changes, those should go away because I've hidden them from everybody. Right. So now there's no creator and none of the items have creators. That's just what that particular plugin does. All of these plugins do very different things. They, they are all kind of based on what people have decided they want Omeka to do. So instead of writing totally new software, they just write a plugin that does the thing that they want it to do. And then they release it so that other people can use it if they find that useful as well. Um, Exhibit Builder comes really with all of them so that you can build exhibits. So that's just the concept of a plugin, is it, it lets you do things um, that Omeka doesn't do by itself. This one here, PDF Embed, that's another one that's good. Um, so let's see, if I search for, um, I've got some PDF items in here. Search items. Uh, I can search. PDF. Actually, I know what I need. I've got some PDFs in syllabi. Right. So I created this. This is just a test collection. This is not a real site, right? I use this in teaching and it's just got a bunch of random stuff in it. So I put a couple syllabi in here, including um, a syllabus for a course I taught, a history course I taught. And you can see here that all there is is a link to this PDF document. So I can, <laughs> I can click on that link. And it'll take me to a PDF, and that's fine. Um, you know, and there's a syllabus for my, for my class that opens in the browser. However, it would obviously be nicer if that displayed in the page, and that's what this plugin does. So it embeds PDF documents into item and file pages. So if I activate it, I can then configure it. And really, this you, can't, you don't have too many configuration items, but I can tell it how high, you, how tall you want the PDF to be. So I've activated that plugin. So now when I refresh this item, you should see an embedded PDF in it, which in fact you do. All right. So those are those are just two examples of the kind. And, and then I, you know I can configure it to say, oh, how tall this should be, how, how tall should this be? So if I say, oh, this should be 800 pixels instead, and click save, then this will increase in size. But again, I can't, I can't really tell you about all of the plugins because there are so many. Um, so on Omeka.net, um, in the help section, you know, they, they have quite good help here. Um, and there are great help documents. It's good to um, consult these. And they also have descriptions of all of the different plugins and what they do. Some of them you'll, you may have with your plan. It'll list them. Here's what this plugin does. Here are some screenshots, all of that. So you can make Omeka do a whole lot. Here's that PDF embed one that I just activated. Here's the description in the help part of Omeka.net explaining what this does. So that's a plugin. Any questions about themes or plugins? Good job. What's up? I was asking, good job. Oh, good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, there are, I get, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, they really are, they really are so powerful. They make, they make it so that you can do a lot with Omeka. Um, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why it's a really popular system. 
Um, but it's, you know, you have to look through, at some point, everybody who's doing a site kind of needs to look through this whole list of all the plugins and see what's what's possible. I mean, all of this help documentation is useful, but like if you want to do something, chances are somebody else wanted to do that and they created a plugin that would make it do that. So it's good to check first, you know, so that, you know, just to, and, and they're very helpful at omeka.net. All right, what is my next unit? I think the next unit is actual hands-on uh, exercises. Oh, I actually do want to talk about um, users of Omeka. Um, so up here in the manage site part, um, there are a number of site settings, by the way. Here you can change, you know, your email, you can change the site title, the site description, which as we talked about is what shows up in Google. You can also say, um, uh, you can configure different things about the search. Um, what do people find when they search? There's basically a lot of different, different stuff here. Um, I do find it's, it's actually a little annoying. It's a good thing to, to click this blue button that says index records because that means make the search work. And I'm like, why is there a make the search work button? Can't, can't the search just work out of the box, but it doesn't. Anyway, so, so those are settings, um, just general settings that you know any website would have. But users is kind of a good thing to go over as well. So obviously, um, if you were to click on the user, uh, for your site that you've created, you, there's one user and that's you. But you can add other users to your site and really there's no limit to the number of users that you can add to the site. You just have to add them one at a time, which is kind of a drag, so it's hard to use it with like 5,000 people or even 500 people. But it's great for small classes of, you know, 10 or 15 or 20. You can add all of the students to the site and you can give them various different roles, which is what I want to talk about. So. Here, where you invite a new user, there are four different roles for users. So I'm a super user because this is my site, and what that means is that I can do anything and everything um, that can be done to the site. An admin user, if I add somebody as an admin user, they can do everything with items, collections, and exhibits, but they can't do anything with themes or plugins or settings. So they can't, if, it, if an admin user can administer all the items, all the content, but they can't change the theme of the site, they can't activate or deactivate or uninstall plugins, they can't, you know, sort of manage the site itself, only the content. But they can do really everything with the content um, that anybody could do. Contributor is often a really good role for students. That means that they can add items to the site, but they can't make them go public without um, somebody else's say so. Um, so sometimes people you know, want to uh, review their students' contributions and so on. I usually don't mind, I just make them admins, but a uh, contributor can be good if you want to really look at what the student has done before it goes public on the site. Researcher, I always wish that these were a little bit in a different order because researcher actually has the, the least amount of privileges. Um, so a researcher can only see items and they can't do anything else. And the reason that that's necessary is that um, for copyright reasons and other reasons, um, some items you may not want to make public, but you want to manage them in Omeka anyway, but you don't want to publish them on the web. So any item that you look at, yeah, I want to, it's going to tell you whether that item is public or not. So here's an item here, and right here, it's going to tell you whether it's public. And in fact, this item is not public. One slightly confusing thing is that I can view this item because I'm logged in. And that's what the researcher role is for. It's to give people a login so that they can see this item. But if I were to um, try to look at this item without being logged into the site, it just wouldn't show up at all. It would be private because that item is not public. So Omeka lets you, um, any, any item that you add to Omeka is by default private. See, look, it's giving me a 404 page not found because I'm not logged in in this browser, whereas I am in the other browser. 
So the researcher role lets you just give people logins so that they can see private items like this one. But I can see this one because I am logged in. So those are user settings. Fan is kind of going large. Um, and then I think it's time to actually add some items. So you're, you should be logged in and you should be um, seeing whoops, this. And if you click on Manage Site, Marco, we can actually start working with this. Um, you can, of course, change your settings. You could add item uh, users. Um, you can mess around with activating plugins or, or changing the theme if you like. Um, but one thing I think you should try to do is add an item. So I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate this really quick. Just adding an item manually. There are ways to add a lot of items at once, um, which I wouldn't mind going over. Um, but I think we should take um, maybe just like a, a 15 minute. Um, exercise slash break <laughs> um, so that you can just just literally play around with it um, okay and then you know like what I would suggest that you do as exercises would be to um, change the theme activate plugins just play around with that do whatever you want with regard to that but then also um, other potential exercises would be to add an item create a collection Beginning, or you could begin creating an exhibit. Creating an exhibit is, it's not, it's a little complicated, so we could go through that. Um, but I thought you could just literally start clicking on things and ask me questions. <laughs> um, I'll quickly demonstrate how to add an item. You know, you go to the items menu over here, you click add an item, and you know, you start typing in fields. Uh, title, I should also add that although Omeka is really for um, like multimedia files, like images, audio, video, and stuff, you don't have to attach any of that to an item. So here's a, you know, so, it, you know, an item can be just what you type in these fields. Fake subject, fake description. None of these are required. Notice here, here's where you can make the item public or not. Here's where you can make it featured or not. You do have to, you know, it's it's much, sometimes, you know, you forget to make things public and that's a little bit of a pain and then you forget that they're not public because you can see them because you're logged in. Um, but it's really easy to go back to the item list later and check a bunch of things and make them all public. So I'll make that public. Um, this page is all just metadata fields, but the place where you add the actual media file is here in files. Item type metadata, this is where you say what kind of item is this. So if it's a still <clears throat> image, you pick that. And here's where you can add some of that um, technical metadata if you want to. Um, if it's a moving image, you could add, you know, timestamps, not timestamps, but time length duration. Um, and then here in files is where you would add the file just from your computer. Okay. And then when uh, you're done with all of that can, would be when you click add item. And that can get you dummy files today, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll, I'll come back. It's twelve eighteen right now. Um, I'll I'll stay here, but uh, and just wait. And you ask you, you play around with it and ask me questions as you go. Okay. No problem. Okay. Tell you what I did. I got a couple of zip files with uh, pictures in them. Uh -huh. I, it won't. Let, I, I've got to unbundle them to, to actually. Yeah, that's so. correct. Yeah, yeah. It won't let you add zip files. There is. Um, I should actually probably have you share your screen. Um, here in Would settings, you? it. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Maybe it's not in here. I feel like somewhere there was. A place that lists what kind of files you can add, but yeah, I know it won't let you add zip files. You have to undo yeah, them. I mean, I'm about to go. Uh...